Big thank you to Sarah Rogers for doing the fourth episode of the Space Engineering Podcast with me. And in this one, we talk all things about the Phoenix CubeSat, for which she was a program manager and systems engineer for at Arizona State University. So we start out discussing what the Phoenix CubeSat is and its missing objectives, and then get into the whole development and testing process that they did for the CubeSat. So first we discuss what went into their first objectives in their development process, which was to create a system to take an image and downlink that image to their ground station. Then we spent a good amount of time talking about communication systems, including radio frequencies, antennas, comms protocols, data packets, spacecraft heartbeat, and in general how comms passes work. We then get into the trade of selecting their flight computer and flight software, which includes talking a bit about I squared C and UART communications protocols. And they had an interesting situation where their flight computer had three UART ports, but they had four components that need to communicate with the flight computer via UART. So they ended up creating a data line switch for the ADCS and camera since they figured out that they wouldn't need both of those at the same time. She then talks a little bit about how they updated their onboard clocks with GPS and then how they use NASA Goddard's Cord flight system software. We then get into a flat sat electrical problem that they had that involved the pull-up resistors for I squared C, which is pretty interesting to hear about. Then we then discuss ADCS testing, day in the life tests, and then onto the systems engineering side, descoping their objectives and requirements. Also, Sarah has her own podcast called The Art of Space Engineering, which I'm a very big fan of and definitely recommend, where similarly to this podcast, she talks to engineers and scientists in the space industry about their expertise. And I'll have links in the description to her podcast. And if you're watching this on YouTube, you can see on the bottom right a ground track plot for Phoenix over 20 orbital periods. So you can get a feel of where Phoenix is in orbit, which it's in a very similar orbit to the International Space Station, since that is where the CubeSat was deployed. So without any further ado, here is the fourth episode of the Space Engineering Podcast with Sarah Rogers. So can we start out by first you describing kind of what the Phoenix CubeSat is and kind of the main objectives of the whole mission? Sure. Yeah, so the Phoenix CubeSat was a 3U CubeSat developed by, entirely developed by a student team at, at Arizona State University. Um, the team was mostly undergraduates. Um, we had a few graduate students working on it towards the end to kind of help, um, you know, finish things up. But for the most part, it was entirely student driven, which was really cool. <laughs> um, we definitely learned a lot the hard way. Um, and basically, the objective of this, the mission was to collect thermal infrared images of various cities around the US to study urban the urban heat island effect. Um, and specifically, we wanted to study the urban heat island effect by looking at these things called local climate zones. And those are basically just different classifications of land, um, you know, that, that kind of break land use down into surface cover and surface structure is, is one way I've heard it described. So, um, an area that is entirely composed of grass is going to, you know, have different thermal properties than, say, you know, like downtown Phoenix, which is composed of a lot of skyscrapers that are, are very high rise, um, you know, very compact. Um, and so we wanted to study how basically the use of land contributed to this increase in temperature by taking thermal images. So um, we proposed this concept of, um, developing this CubeSat and using all commercial off-the-shelf products. So in a sense, it was also kind of a technology demonstration um, in the sense that, you know, usually when you're developing, like, like the Landsat satellites, for example, um, those, the instruments that are collecting data, it's, you know, all of it is very specific to the mission and their requirements and what it's trying to do. They're not using something that's entirely off-the-shelf to, to take this data. Um, so in a sense, it was kind of a technology demonstration that we wanted to take this, you know, FLIR camera that isn't necessarily, you know, always used in space or made for the, um, the space environment, um, but fits a, a 3U platform and just see what kind of science we can do with it. Um, and that's something that's, you know, still kind of still being tried by, by different um, organizations. So that's in essence what Phoenix was aiming to do. Um, the minimum mission objective, though, was really just to be an educational platform for the student team. So basically, we the minimum objective was just to send the CubeSat to space, take a single image, and downlink it to the AAC Brown Station. And, you know, and just uh, all of the educational, um, you know, things that you learn that, that come along uh, with that. So whether it worked or not, it, it 
that's still considered a success by the by the student team because we still got that educational aspect out of it. Mm -hmm. So and you got involved pretty early, I think the beginning, right, when you work on the proposal. So can you talk a little bit about that and kind of what motivated you and how you found the opportunity to work on the CubeSat? Yeah, uh, so my, I guess my involvement in Phoenix is a kind of, it's, it's entire, it was very, I was very lucky, got very mm -hmm. lucky. Um, so I, I did join the project when the proposal was being written and I was actually a freshman at ASU at the time. Mm -hmm. So I, I had started at ASU, um, you know, majored in aerospace and just knew I, you know, I really liked space, um, wasn't sure exactly what I wanted to do with it. Um, and I found this organization, uh, the student organization at ASU called the Sun Double Satellite Lab. And they were working more on, more so on the, the spacecraft side or like developing, um, you know, CubeSat concepts or uh, concepts for uh, CubeSat components um, and doing other design build fly competitions that were kind of more related towards spacecraft as opposed to like rocketry or something. Mm -hmm. um, and so I joined that organization and, um, Dr. Judd Bowman, who is the PI for Phoenix, approached our organization with this idea um, to, uh, he had this idea to develop a CubeSat to study the urban heat islands um, because there was, uh, NASA had put out a, a grant for um, university student teams to design a CubeSat and, or, you know, sounding rocket. It, it was basically um, a way for NASA to give funding to um, undergraduate students to pursue something that, you know, typically costs a lot of money, but would give them the opportunity to, um, you know, design, develop, and launch some sort of, you know, orbital platform. Um, and so we wanted to do a, a CubeSat. Um, and so he needed a group of students to basically design the CubeSat and then help write a proposal for it and submit it to NASA. So as part of that student organization, I got involved in that process. Um, and that's kind of how I got involved with Phoenix. And then I just kind of, you know, stuck through, um, stuck through with it for, for the next five years <laughs> um, because it was just, it encompassed just everything that I, I loved about space exploration. And I loved working with the, the people I was working with. And I was just really motivated to see it through all the way to the end. Um, and I was the project manager ever since the beginning, <laughs> which, mm -hmm is where the accidental part kind of comes in because the the group was a very very small group at the time it was like 12 people and so we were kind of going around the room and you know all of the the senior members got more of like the sub team leads like mm -hmm. we had one electrical engineer okay so obviously he's going to be the electrical lead um you know one guy who was um in, in computer science so obviously he's going to do software mm -hmm. um and actually the last thing that they kind of delved out to anybody was project manager and I was like the last one. <laughs> so that's, that's kind of how I became the project manager. Uh, you know, didn't know what a CubeSat was like two months before we wrote this thing. Um, and, and then now I had to lead one. So that um, it was a very interesting <laughs> experience. Yeah, so then why don't we get into kind of the whole development process, how you did this. So you talked a bit about um, how you guys broke it up by demos. So say where the first demo was take a picture and then downlink it to the ground station. So, wait, so the first thing, and I'm wondering, was that ground station already there at the time you started or were you developing that in parallel? Uh, a little bit of both. So okay. we had components, um, we had components at ASU. We did have to buy a few things. Like we bought the ground station radio, which was the ICOM 9100. Um, but we had things like Goggies. We borrowed a, a rotor system from another program. So it, the rotors were used to help track um, Phoenix as it passed over the ground station. So we had to buy some things. We had some things in house because we were trying to, people before our, you know, our, our group kind of started doing this, we're trying to build up a ground station platform at ASU. So we, we had infrastructure. Mm -hmm. um, it just wasn't, uh, it just wasn't like fully complete for what, what we needed. So we kind of helped finish that side of it. Um, and then there's like all of the very specific like software components that that we needed to add to um, to command Phoenix from the ground. So, mm -hmm. okay. So then, can we get to the development of kind of all the sure. tasks that are required in order to do a task such as um, 
you know, just take a picture and downlink it to a ground station, which sounds simple at the surface, but there's actually so much that has to go on from there. So can you talk a bit about kind of how to go about that process and how you guys ended up breaking that down into smaller ones? Yeah. Uh, all right. That's a, <laughs> that is a big question. Um, so I guess we'll start off with what is required. So this kind of goes back to how you organize requirements. Um, and was kind of a, just like an organizationally in an area that, that we actually struggled with for, for a little while and just trying to, to figure out what really was, you know, just the bare, bare minimum of what we needed. Because you can program the spacecraft to do a bunch of things to just take a single picture and downlink it. You can add a bunch of complexity to that, but that's not what you want to do. You, you need to make the system as, um, you know, simple as possible because um, that's going, that's really going to help you achieve mission success. Um, and it's also going to take a lot less time because you have to do a bunch of checks with any kind of software program that you're writing because you want to make sure that it's foolproof and nothing's going to break it. Um, so uh, I guess, you know, at the very top level, what is required to take a picture and downlink it to the ground station? So kind of going through all of the different systems, um, the ADCS, so, well, aside from just taking, a, um, just taking, okay, so we'll, we'll just start with taking a picture. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, sorry. So I just taking, no, 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 thought. you're good. Yeah. <laughs> you're good. Um, I've just never had to like kind of describe it in this way. So I, <laughs> hopefully this doesn't get too rambly, um, but just, just taking the picture itself. Okay, so the, the camera takes a picture um, and then based on how we designed our interfaces, um, we decided to uh, store, so the, the camera has its own like internal memory where it stores any photo that it takes. Um, so the camera would take a picture, it store it in its internal memory. Based on how we designed our electrical interfaces, um, we then had to send a command to pull that specific image off of the internal memory and send it to our OVC for storage. Mm -hmm. um, and so just that process is kind of like, okay, you have to send a command to take the picture. And then you have to you know, write a program that is capable of collecting that picture and then basically reading in all of the bytes from the image and making sure that it, it's gotten all of them, um, doing several checks along the way to make sure that the program hasn't broken or seen an error anywhere. Um, so that way, you know, you, you know that the image isn't bad um, or that in something else in, in your code hasn't gone wrong. So there's, there's you know, a whole lot of code that, that goes into developing that. And I think just writing that code took um, Craig, who was our, our um, flight software lead, it took him like 80 hours one week to just kind of get this, just collecting the picture and sending it to the OVC. Because um, it, it was, there's just a lot of, um, you know, checks and testing that goes into that, that, I, you know, we didn't even realize before we started, um, started programming everything. But that's at least what goes into just getting a picture. Apart from that, um, as you're collecting the picture, so we can't, the CubeSat can't just, in orbit, it's going so fast. And so if we wanted to say, collect a picture of Phoenix, uh, Arizona, <laughs> um, we had, you can't just take a picture and then not do anything to like change your attitude um, because then that picture is going to be extremely blurry. So. Um, in addition to just taking the picture, you also have to command your attitude determination and control system or ADCS to orient the spacecraft and basically track to um, this ground target that you give it. So um, that allows the, the camera to stay fixed on that one location while the, um, the spacecraft just slews um, a long track and um, allows you to reduce a lot of that image blur. Um, so, so that is essentially all handled by the ADCS. We didn't have to program anything specific for, well, we didn't make the code that runs on the ADCS that kind of, you know, does all of the computation and then tells it what to do. We had to write the software that just sent the appropriate command and parameters to the ADCS to say, hey, track to this Latin long coordinate. Um, and the ADCS kind of knows where it is in its orbit. And based on all of that and the calculations that it's doing internally, it's, it's able to figure out how to orient itself um, and, and slew in order to, to do 
that um, that maneuver. Mm -hmm. um, so that's essentially what the ADCS does. And then um, apart from that, we uh, just for the downlink process, um, we were transmitting everything over UHF. So lower frequencies, we had S-band in a concept for a little while and then had to descope it because just mainly because of time um, and, and resources, we just wouldn't have been able to um, fully piece it together in, in time. Cause we, you know, with CubeSat teams, you get a lot of student turnover. So it's, mm -hmm. um, it can get difficult to complete milestones, especially when there's, you know, a, it requires a lot of long man hours in the lab. Um, but all of, so all of our downlink was done over UHF. Um, so it takes longer, um, but it doesn't require any kind of directional pointing. So we had a, um, we had a omnidirectional antenna on the very top panel of the spacecraft, um, which is, yeah, <laughs> which is, is able to kind of transmit um, a signal in, in all directions and get it down to the ASU ground station, which where we then receive it, um, collect the image, and then store it um, for the future. Um, mm -hmm. But there's checks that go into that as well. You got to make sure, I mean, the image is a, it's a large file. So you have to make sure that you get all of the, all of the bytes that compose that image. Um, so you can basically recreate it on the ground. So that's kind of what we had to do is we had to write this um, custom, uh, you know, packet handling protocol um, that would essentially check how, however many packets it was getting back and then um, re-request packets, any packets that it needed in order to um, make sure that we got the entire image file. Because uh, in addition, to, since the, the spacecraft is so far away, you are going to have some link latency there where you're not necessarily going to get everything in one pass. It's going to take a couple of tries in order just in order to get one file because um, you could miss some things. Um, or if you run out of time with a pass, then maybe you only get half of a file and you have to wait until the next pass to get the rest. So there, um, there's other, yeah, so there's, there's a lot of work that went in, into that as well. It took us, it took us a few months to, to fully get that, that working right. So I'm wondering about the trades, about how to choose which radio frequencies that you use. So can you talk a little bit about that, about what are the different options that are out there for CubeSats and then kind of what makes some frequencies better than others in some situations? Sure. So the, at least the radio frequency that you use, it's all mission dependent and based on what you're trying to do. So we, in using UHF, one benefit of that is that we're, we're able to use um, amateur radio frequencies. Um, and so basically it's, that's just kind of a, cause the, well, let me back up a little bit. So if you look at kind of a breakdown of the whole frequency spectrum, this is all certain frequency, certain frequency ranges are all dedicated to different, um, either different organizations or different applications. Um, so like some bands are restricted only for like, you know, military use or, or something like that. Um, but one common band that is, is very open for people to use is the amateur, uh, amateur radio band. Um, and so that's a range from about 430 to 440 megahertz um, that, that you can, you get, you have to apply for a license to, to operate in. Um, and then once you get that license, you can then transmit um, at a certain frequency. So there's a whole licensing process you have to go through where, um, we had to talk to the IARU and the FCC and kind of, you know, give them all of the, the specifications for our transmitter. And um, after they reviewed all of those and reviewed um, uh, all of the specs for our ground station as well, and they, you know, kind of made sure that we weren't going to, they try to, they try to pick a frequency for you such that you won't interfere with anyone else um, while you're transmitting. Uh, so that kind of allows them to coordinate the whole process and make sure that people aren't stepping on other people's frequencies. Um, so, so we basically just told them we want to use the amateur radio band. Um, and, and we chose that mainly because of how open it is. Um, and there's also a very, just a very large amateur radio community out there 
of people who can can get involved. So so some of it's nice in the sense that you can involve the public in your mission, um, and we also were able to you know get help from people when it came to um, came to the ground station, communicating with the spacecraft in orbit, trying to debug things when we're having issues on orbit. Um, so so that's also a benefit of it too. And then I'm wondering about the trades for, or was it a pretty obvious trade for the omnidirectional antenna for that case? Because you mentioned that, um, I think, yeah, the UHF, you have, or does it make sense in that case to use omnidirectional all the time? Or was, yeah, I'm just kind of wondering the trades of the omnidirectional versus, I forget what the term is, but it's more like U8 or um, more like focused. Uh, it's just directional. Directional, yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't know if I've seen, I think, you know, I'm not I'm not super familiar with why some um, why some bands are more directional than others. It might just have to do with like a concentration of energy, but I don't don't quote me on that. <laughs> um, so so like when we had an, an S band uh, system in our design, that was directional, and so we had to put a patch antenna on the side of the spacecraft, and if we had to downlink anything to the ground station, we had to also track. Um, a large dish antenna um, in order to get a signal down. Um, I haven't seen any directional UHF antennas. Um, so with, with UHF, the you just kind of, we had, so the antenna has four rods that stick out on all four sides of basically this, you know, kind of square, um, yeah, square system. Uh, or square board, I should say, that that sits on top of um, on top of the CubeSat, and all of that is is radiating energy um, just out in into space. Um, but with things like uh, you know GPS, the GPS antenna we had was also directional. Um, so I, I, I'm not sure exactly why it's concentrated that way. Um, unless it just has to do with like a concentration of, of energy or power, so. Okay, and then I'm also wondering, because you talked about how initially when you were doing this demo of taking a picture and then down looking to the ground station, it was taking roughly like 75 minutes-ish, if I heard correctly, to downlink that entire image, but eventually you were able to get it down to like roughly five. So kind of like that whole process of what you realized, basically how do we take out things that we don't need in order to actually be able to get this task done in a reasonable amount of time? Yeah, and that, that was a very interesting one as well. <laughs> so we, um, when we first did the demo, so we, we had a lab for context, we had a lab-based setup. Um, so we had a flat sat, which is a term that's commonly used for CubeSats, where it's kind of like all of your engineering model hardware um, is all connected together. Um, so like we had a full engineering model system, which was basically a replica of all of our flight hardware. And then we just kept... Um, our flight hardware pristine, so we would it would just be used in, on the final, um, you know, spacecraft. Um, wouldn't get dirty or you know possibly damaged or anything like that as we're trying to to program things, put things together. So we had our flat set and then a, a lab based. Um, well, we had our the ICOM ground station, uh, the ICOM radio, and then the our TNC, which is used for demodulating packets. Um, and then just a, a small antenna all set up in, in a lab. And then we use basically that exact same hardware, but with larger Yagi antennas and a rotor system on the roof um, of one of the buildings at ASU uh, for the actual like full ground station setup. So that's kind of what we had going in the lab. Um, and when we were initially, so basically what we were doing is we were transmitting from our flat set hardware to our lab based ground station. Um, and, um, at first it took us about 15 minutes to fully downlink, uh, a picture. Mm -hmm. Um, and the main reason behind that is, is really, it goes down just into the specifics of exactly how you're, uh, handling all of the packets as you both send them out and then receive them. Um, so... Because basically, so when you have a file and you're trying to get a file from point A to point B, you still have to 
process that file and kind of and break it up into smaller pieces, do all of the handling that's associated with doing that, like through through software wise, um, and then all of that is then sent to the radio. The radio then sends it to um, transmits that it's uh, received by the antennas in the radio system, which then goes through the TNC or terminal mode controller, which demodulates it, and then that goes to the computer and it's it's displayed there. So the real issue was more so on the, the spacecraft side with how we were kind of um, basically separating all of those individual um, packets and then transmitting them out as well. Um, and I forgot, I forgot like specifically what we were, oh, okay, no, I remember now. Um, so there's, there's other things that you can, there's, there's various protocols you can use for transmitting from the spacecraft to the ground station. Either with whatever you use, what you're trying to do is make sure that um, what you got at point A ends up at point B. Um, so some of the protocols we were trying um, would transmit a, I think, I think it's called, I think it's called RDP. I think, yeah, yeah. Um, reliable data, pro data packet protocol or data protocol, it's one of those. Um, but basically what it does is it, it kind of sends out like a, a small ping message that then is received by the ground station and the ground station has to acknowledge that it's received something. So basically what, what this protocol is doing is that it, it's checking to make sure that there's a, uh, a viable link um, between the spacecraft and the ground station before it transmits anything over at all. And so that was going to kind of be that was our first way of kind of saying, okay, so maybe we could use this to make sure that um, uh, when we transmit a, sing a single packet, so this is just for transmitting one of like, you know, hundreds or thousands of packets, depending on the file size that you're transmitting. Um, just to make sure that one packet gets down, we can use this as kind of like a check. And then if there's not a good link there, then um, the protocol will basically send the message out again and then wait for an acknowledgement. Then it will just keep transmitting that until it gets an acknowledgement and then it will start trying to send your file. So we were using that protocol and it was taking forever because it just kept having to wait for the ground station to acknowledge um, a message before it could send anything out. So that, that was one thing those kinds of checks were things that caused um, just transmitting a single image, even though like the ground station is was literally you know maybe five feet away or so from from the cubesat um, with attenuators to to attenuate power and everything we were we were safe about it, um, <laughs> um, but but it's doing it's doing checks like that that kind of you know builds up time, um, and so through kind of going through different options that we had and doing research on, on different protocols, we kind of, that's when we kind of made our own um, where everything was was just uh, sent out, um, you know, one packet after another. And then we had code on the ground station side that would basically collect a, collect a packet, um, see what the packet number was and how many packets um, it should receive in total and then kind of store all of those and then it would go back and check, okay, which packet numbers didn't I receive? Um, and then based on which packets it didn't get, then it would just re-request those. Um, so that's kind of how, that's how we solved that, that problem was um, just by creating something of our own that could kind of handle all of that a little bit more efficiently, just kind of track um, the number of packets that it didn't get and then just request them later. So that's how we got it down, I think to, I think in the end it was about, it was five minutes. Um, that it took to transmit one image. So I'm wondering, again, whether it's a little bit obvious or if there are trades of how to structure a packet um, and kind of how that works. Like, do you start with a, I don't know, some byte that says, hey, this is the beginning of a packet, then send the rest? You're kind of wondering how that all works. Yeah. Um, so it, as far as trades go, I can't, I can't say what, too much about like what other people use. So for, mm -hmm. you know, for, um, for links to say the Mars Curiosity rover, I, I don't know 
what kind of protocols they have in place to, to check that there's you know, something reliable. Mm -hmm. um, but basically, but our, our, our system kind of, so with, with your, your packet structure, you have, usually you'll have a, you'll have a packet header um, and then the data portion in the middle and then a footer. And I don't remember exactly how we did this. I think you might have put it in the header um, of the of the the packet, um, but just kind of what what packet number that was that we were transmitting, and then we kind of had code that would calculate the number of packets that a, a file should be composed of, and so then that was also appended to the header as well. So then. The, the code on the ground side um, would just kind of check those and, and make a note of it um, and then keep track of any ones that it didn't get. Um, but yeah, so that, that was kind of, that was kind of more, ex I guess more exactly how we broke it down and, and where we put certain things. Um, and I'm blanking, there were, there were a few other I think there were a few other protocols that people might use for reliable just transfer of data, but I, I can't quite remember what they were at the moment. I just remember the, the reliable, uh, I just remember RDP because we mm -hmm. play with that a little bit. Yeah. So. And I'm also wondering, because you mentioned a lot like the a heartbeat signal, just where the spacecraft says everything that's going on. So I'm wondering <laughs> how you go about picking exactly what goes in the heartbeat. Yeah. And that's, um, so that, that was, that took a little bit too. <laughs> um, of, so basically the heartbeat, well, let me phrase it this way. So, so the, the heartbeat is meant to give you an instantaneous snapshot of the health of the spacecraft um, mm -hmm. when, it, when you receive it. And so essentially what you want to do with the heartbeat is make sure that any vital information that you absolutely need. So like what, what at the minimum information do you need to understand if the spacecraft is healthy um, or if something is going wrong. So for us, these were things like um, uh, current current draws for all of the various components. So we had a total current draw for everything that was um, drawing from a 3.3 volt line, a five volt line, like a 12 volt line. Um, and then we, well, that kind of, yeah, so to our, our, our EPS had, um, our electrical power system mm -hmm. basically had three lines that were just always supplying either three volts, five volts, or 12 volts. And then there are usually switchable rails in a spacecraft where you can turn these on and off. So these are for components that you don't wanna have on all the time. Um, and so that's kind of like your on off switch uh, for in, in space. So we basically had, we would write down the, the current values of all of those power lines out to, um, to our heartbeat. Um, and so we could use that as, as um, very clear diagnostic data as to what was on. And if something is drawing less power than it should, than it normally is, then that's typically when you know, okay, this, you know, something might be wrong. Like usually we're drawing like 500 milliamps from, this component, and now we're only drawing 200. We've never seen that before. And what's what's going on? Is something broken? Um, so that's so current values are um, it's they're really some of the most important information that you can gather from any of your hardware. What else do we have on there? We had other diagnostic things like um, so we had to implement a cipher system on the spacecraft, which basically checked. Um, so when, when you're commanding the spacecraft to take a picture and, and downlink it, um, those aren't really commands that we want to release to the public. <laughs> we, don't, we don't want people knowing exactly how to command our satellite. Um, so one thing that we did is, you know, we didn't publish how exactly we broke down our um, commanding structure. Um, and another thing we did is we implemented this cipher feature. Um, which basically enabled, made it such that this, the spacecraft would only accept schedule files. Uh, schedule files are a, a list of commands, just one after the other of 
things you want to execute or things you want the spacecraft to do one after the other. Mm -hmm. um, so it would make sure that the spacecraft would only accept schedule files that were sent by us and not by anyone else. So no one else can um, you know, figure out how to command our spacecraft and then tell it to do something. So we, we had something in our health beacon that always told us what cipher number we were on. Um, so that way we, you know, we, we knew, <laughs> we, like we could, we, there was no way we could possibly lose track of that. Cause if we did, then, okay, we can't send our spacecraft a schedule file <laughs> um, without a lot of trial and error. So we had, we had things like that too, that kind of helped us keep up with, with maintenance and, and um, operations on the ground. Uh, other things like temperatures so knowing how hot and cold um, certain things are, um, were important. And um, we also found that the, the memory storage on board, or at least with the way that, that we programmed Phoenix, um, the amount of memory storage that was available on the system was important to have in the heartbeat as well for us, um, because we were basically storing everything in RAM. We wanted to send everything to SD cards, um, but in the interest of time, we didn't have a chance to really implement that and test it and make sure that it was completely foolproof before we sent it to space. So um, we just stored everything in RAM, but we noticed that as we used it more of RAM, of, um, as we stored more like logs, images, things of that nature in RAM, the processor would slow down. And so all of your commands are now slowing down. So if you tell it to take a picture at like 3.41 p.m. and like 10 seconds after that, <laughs> um, you know, that, that command might be delayed by a few seconds or, um, or many seconds, depending on how full um, that, that memory storage is. So, so it was kind of things, things like that, that that helped us keep track of, of the spacecraft and, and managing it, um, and also would give us a, a good snapshot of, um, of how it was doing. Um, and then we had just a larger telemetry log that we stored on the spacecraft that had a lot more comprehensive um, uh, information about the, all of the components. Um, so maybe any currents that we weren't gathering or temperature values we weren't gathering. Um, think any, yeah, we had error logs to log errors with, with commands and things of that nature. So there, there, there are other things that we implemented to still get as much information uh, as we needed. Mm -hmm. So going back to kind of getting the downlink time to be as small as possible or a reasonable value, can you talk a little bit about the geometry of how passes work overhead? Um, yeah, just that be, to be able to, how do you measure what a reasonable time value is and how long you're going to have on each pass to actually communicate with CubeSat? So you can, can you talk a little bit about that, about how the passes work and their geometry? Yeah. So we didn't do, I guess... I'll say this, we didn't do have to do any like crazy hand calculations to see, you know, how long um, it would take Phoenix to pass overhead and kind of base it off of that. You can use uh, software, really, really useful software called gpredict. Um, and what that does is you, it allows, well, you can link it to your ground station and also to your antenna system. So the, the rotors that are helping um, track the spacecraft and then you can use that to, um, so each each spacecraft has, it, it, once it's in orbit, it will be associated with what's called a two-line element set, um, which has information on basically the position of the spacecraft in orbit and then other things like um, drag terms. Um, and so gpredict can keep track of that. You'll have to update the TLEs every so often like from, from the internet, but it basically keeps track of that and then it can tell you where in orbit the spacecraft is at any given time. Um, and then you can tell it where your ground station is on the planet, tell it what its parameters are, and then it will tell you, okay, a pass is going to start at this time and it's going to last until this time. So in that sense, we know, okay, the technically we will have a pass that's about for us, it was about 10 minutes long, um, and this is with using 
a ground station with, with Yagis that have about you know 15 degrees of elevation above the horizon. So basically they can they can start to see a spacecraft at about 15 degrees above the horizon. The NASA goes over and then 180 degrees later, it will drop off after um, 180 minus 1565. <laughs> uh, <laughs> mental math. Um, so so the, the software makes it a lot easier to do that. Um, but every pass is not the same. So every pass is going to have, based on where the spacecraft is in its trajectory, um, it's going to have a different maximum elevation that it could possibly reach and then, mac and then uh, an azimuth um, that it can reach as well. The elevation is really the most critical component. So you want, well, so with the ground station, you wanna make sure you have very good, we, sky access is, is how we refer to it. And that's basically um, your antennas aren't blocked by a lot of really tall buildings around the area. And, uh, you know, they're able to see a lot of the sky above them. Um, and that's really important because you want to, because any, you know, if there are buildings kind of all around, um, that's going to interfere with your, your reception. Um, and it's going to make it difficult for you to, to get things to the spacecraft. So um, so we, we made sure we had a decent enough uh, sky access at, uh, by putting them on a roof at a building at ASU. Um, and and so, so once you have that, then another parameter that becomes important is the elevation of a pass. Um, and the elevation is basically how, how do I describe this? <laughs> Like angle, um, angle above the horizon. I mean, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but in, yeah, in, in like in the vertical sense. Um, oh. And so a uh, high elevations, so like if you have a 90 degree elevation, for example, it means that you're basically passing directly above where your antennas are. Um, and which is very good because then you have just like this, you know, completely direct signal line to the spacecraft. Um, so with a higher elevation, because you have more direct access, you're able to have a stronger, I shouldn't say stronger, a better link um, between your ground station and, and your spacecraft. Um, and so once you have that, it just makes it easier to communicate. You don't have to try, you know, uh, like five to 10 times just to transmit a single command um, that you may have to on, on lower elevation passes. Um, azimuth can, become an issue depending on just like what's around you. Um, so that's, but that wasn't as much of an issue with us. It was more elevation. Um, so, and you, you also have, cause like sometimes we had passes that had elevations of like 20 degrees and it's like, okay, we're not gonna, <laughs> we're not gonna hear anything. Um, so in that sense of finding, okay, like what, if we have to pay attention to any pass, like what, what do we even pay attention to? It's like, okay, if it's above like 30 degrees, it's probably, we can probably do something. Um, and that we kind of just found from trial and error for, for the most part. Um, but I guess to get back to durations, so, and and because this ties in with elevation and, and everything, um, you have 10 minutes that the CubeSat will be within range of the spacecraft, but within that 10 minutes, there's only gonna be about three minutes is what is what we found. Um, of usable downlink or uplink time. And that's basically just when um, the CubeSat has um, kind of gotten above that kind of minimum threshold of what elevation is good. So if we have like a maximum elevation of 80 degrees, at some point it's going to reach 30 degrees, at which point we probably have a good signal to it. And then that's only going to last for you know, maybe about three minutes or so um, before it's we can't really communicate with it anymore. So um, might think, oh, great, you know, we have 10 minutes to do anything we want. We've got all this time. Um, and it that's doesn't end up being the case. Um, and the interesting thing about that is that it really affects kind of your mindset of how you go about sending commands because you only have a certain amount of time and you have to, if something comes back and it's, it's wrong, it's like you've only got three minutes to like figure out what to do. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and then correct uh, correct some sort of an issue before the CubeSat's gone and you have to either try to work with someone else at a different ground station to you know help you know get them to help fix the problem 
um, or wait several hours until the uh, the CubeSat comes back around and is overhead again. So. Okay, so then I want to move on to the trades, or if you had any, or again, if it was a little bit obvious for what flight computer that you used, your um, your onboard computer. So I think you mentioned that you used some GOM space one, but was that <laughs> your only option, or did you have a few to choose from and then decided on that one? That is a good qu question, and it's an interesting question. <laughs> so we, let's see, so we did use the GOM space NanoMind A3200, which which is a good computer. Um, we chose this mainly for volume. Uh, yeah, we chose this mainly for volume constraints to max to maximize the amount of volume we, we were able to get. So, um, but but there are, there were other reasons for it as well. Um, so basically, with, within a CubeSat, all of your electronics are usually stacked on top of each other. Um, and anything else that you don't have, you're connecting with wires. And, and that's really, I think, the main reason why they decided to make it more of a stack configuration is to just minimize the number of wires um, that you have to kind of plug around all over the place. Because it's actually kind of hard to wire things in a CubeSat because there's so little volume for you to like plug things in. And um, even the, the boards themselves were, are still only a few millimeters away from the, the edge of the or at least the you know spacecraft pan uh, structural panels, mm -hmm. so it's actually kind of hard to plug things in. But um, so since everything's kind of stacked, you have to be very careful with how you're using volume. Um, so the nice thing about the NanoMind is that we could integrate it onto a motherboard, and then there on that same motherboard we could also integrate a transceiver and a GPS. So in that sense, we now took you know, three components that could have taken up a lot of room if we took them from, if each of them had their own individual um, uh, boards that are about the size of like a 1U and didn't go on anything else. And then we compressed all of that on, into one, um, one board essentially. Well, onto one board, but three other little boards went onto that one. <laughs> um, so that was one of the main reasons we chose it is because we really liked how uh, we could. We really liked how it made our volume very efficient. Um, we. I don't remember what other computers we were deciding on, um, but we did like the GOM space one as well because at the time it really met, and it, it still did in the end, but at, more so in the beginning, uh, we were planning to use a lot of um, components over I two C, and so we weren't super can you know constrained on data interfaces and exactly what we needed. Um, and so the, the, GOM, the NanoMind also met all of those requirements. It met requirements for memory. And we were also considering of, you know, just using um, an SD card at the time. So we weren't super concerned about memory. Um, processing speed was, was pretty good. Um, and so, so we liked how it integrated with all of these things and the features it offered were based on what we knew at the time, you know, kind of just what we were looking for. Um, we ran into some issues with interfaces towards the end. Um, so at the beginning, I mentioned a lot of things were just being, a lot of our data interfaces were more I2C based. And then we decided to minimize those as much as possible because we wanted to minimize the risk for I2C lockups. Um, so if, if two things are possibly communicating at the same time and, and one's kind of stepping on the other, it's some, something to that that caliber. Um, so we switched some of our components over to UART or CAN uh, communications. Um, and so one issue we, we ran into it, with our OBC is that we had four things that needed to use UART and we had only, our OBC only had three outputs for UART. <laughs> So we ended up having to implement a, um, a switching mechanism on an interface board that we made um, uh, so that way we could switch uh, data back and forth between our payload and our ADCS system. And that only worked because we were never going to use, we were never going to command the ADCS and the camera at the same time. Um, we could always have the ability to switch back and forth from one to another. 
Um, so, so we had to do a workaround because of some, a change that we implemented late. Um, so how does that kind of refer back to, you know, what kind of trades or things you're looking for when you're choosing an OBC? Uh, well, really that's the things that you wanna make sure of is, you know, does it have all of the features that, that you need? Um, is, it, is it going to help you volume wise? Are you really concerned about that? Um, and also most importantly, does it have all of the data um, input and outputs that you possibly need um, for connecting all of your components? So when you're really in the design phase, it's, it's really important to just take a, a very, very strong look at everything from a system level and make sure that uh, you're not missing anything with hardware interfaces that could possibly um, cause an, uh, that could possibly make it difficult for you to interface them together um, and making sure that you really understand that all of the data interfaces you've chosen are, are what you want. Um, so it's things like that that kind of help you narrow down uh, what systems you need. Um, also, if there's any software framework that comes along with them. So the, the OBC and the, the transceiver that we use, the X100 from Gonspace, also had software that went along with them that helped basically handle the flow of data from one to another. Um, and then there were other additional features that, that Gomspace had implemented to kind of help um, help CubeSat teams, you know, kind of just put the whole system together. So one, one thing that they added in, in the transceiver, for example, was that reliable data uh, transfer protocol that, that did the acknowledgement um, that I was talking about earlier. So if there's a software framework like that, that um, you think might help you, then it's good to know that as well. And that might drive your choice of an OBC. It also might make the price a lot more expensive because you might have to buy additional things in order to use that software, which might make you not want to use that. Mm -hmm. um, and that was something that we didn't really take into account in the beginning. Um, we did have to buy an additional software package to basically keep using the OBC. Um, so it's, it's things like that that might kind of sway you from one choice to another. Um, and that's kind of why we, we ended up picking ours. Could you real quick explain the I squared C and the UART? Are they, are they, from what I remember, they're communications protocols, but are they more than that? Does it also get down to the hardware or is that kind of what they are? Just communications protocols? It does, it does get down to the hardware to some, I'm, so it has to do with how data is transmitted because you're still transmitting a, a signal um that's going that's going to have some voltage associated with it um so like i think i, think I can i think i can explain them but i also i'm going off of memory and i might get something wrong and i, I don't want to um incorrectly no, okay. define them um yeah. but but you're, you're right it does kind of get down to the hardware too because with i2c at least um because what you're transmitting is essentially uh, a signal you need resistors connected to it to help pull that voltage up to, to the level that's uh, necessary to get the signal from, from point A to point B. Mm -hmm. um, and if you don't have those resistors there, then the other end's never gonna get what you send it. Um, so in a sense, so yes, it is related to hardware, but it is also a protocol for handling data um, and, and, and transmitting it from one end to the other. Um, so I'm interested in this, how you ran out of the UART ports and then decided that the ADCS and camera were the two that were never going to be on at the same time. So for that ADCS, so you say you give the ADCS um, subsystem a command that says, look at this lat long at this time with this angular velocity, mm -hmm. and then you can just shut it off and then go to the camera, take a picture at this time. So, so you decided, were there any other two components that you were thinking about? Maybe we could put them on the same line with that switch or was those two kind of the, the obvious decision in this case? Yeah, so um, it, it ended up being an obvious decision, but it's not, we still have to think about it a little bit. So mm -hmm. um, basically the four components that we're using UART were the, the ADCS, uh, the FLIR, which is our, our camera, um, our GPS, and then we also had, we needed UART for USB. Um, so 
once you have the whole spacecraft completely, you know, packaged up together, how are you going to plug into it to upload software um, or have a look at what's, you know, just the terminal output? Because um, you, you might still need to debug something. So we needed a UART line for that kind of um, that kind of access. Mm -hmm. um, so so we we knew like UART uh, that sorry the USB line was completely off limits because we were always going to need that mm -hmm. for just for testing wise in space we're not going to use it but um, for any kind of testing we just needed full access for that so that's why we kept that just as its own thing um, the GPS. Basically, so even though we're taking pictures of a certain location, we didn't really care about getting positional status from the GPS, um, mainly because their CubeSats are just tracked so well on the ground and it's, it's usually pretty accurate. We didn't really need to correlate the, the two, we weren't planning to. Um, and the position data was, wasn't really feeding back into any other kind of command or maintenance that was being done on the spacecraft. Um, the, the GPS, what a GPS is really important for, at least for us, um, was for time updates. So all of our commanding is, it's all based on time. Um, when we want to take a picture, our commanding structure is basically if timestamp and schedule equals time on OVC, do the thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so if our if the, the, the clock on our OBC, um, the, so our OBC had it, it it's basically keeping track of, um, uh, of UTC time. And um, that time has to be updated every so often because it's going to, the, the clock is going to drift over a certain amount of time. Um, so that's why we had the GPS on there. So we could get a time update from the GPS satellites and then use that time to update the clock on, on the onboard computer. Um, and that allowed our, our, all of our, our commands to basically stay in sync and we could take images exactly when we wanted to take images. Um, so, so that's why we needed the GPS, but the GPS wasn't, it was only periodically updating the clock. So we would basically turn it on like once every six hours and then use it to update the clock on the OVC just as to, to be safe. Um, and so we didn't wanna run the risk where the GPS was trying to update the clock maybe at the same time as the camera was taking a picture or the ADCS had to do some sort of maneuver. We, since it was so, since it was automatic, we didn't wanna mess with it. So we kind of just left that as its own thing. Um, and then really the ADCS and the camera just were the only ones that kind of went smoothly together. Because once we told the ADCS to track to a certain lat long coordinate, it just did its thing. And we didn't have to send in another command. Um, well, we sent it, to, we had, we did have to send it a command kind of at the end to reorient it. Um, but we made sure that that was only being sent like well after we were done with the camera. Um, so that kind of goes more into, I guess, our operational structure and, and how we decided to lay out the commands and how far away they were spaced and everything. Um, but yeah, that was really the only way that we could do that, that switch. So did that ADCS system that you guys used have an orbit determination system on it? So then how would it know which way to point with respect to itself in order to hit the lat long? It did have an orbit propagator on oh, okay. it. Um, but for the most part, so like our ADCS system had, um, it had earth horizon sensors. So it could sense the cold of space and the, and the warm of the earth and kind of figure out, um, I guess that would help with its orientation as well. Um, and then we also had a magnetometer on there, which sensed the, the magnetic poles of the earth and, and also used that for, um, for orientation control. Um, so, so basically the ADCS software is taking all of that in, um, in addition to uh, input from sun sensors that we had on all six faces of the spacecraft that determined what the solar angle was. And it's, it's using all of that and, um, and well, I guess another thing that I should mention as well is one thing we had to do is we had to tell it 
kind of where it was in orbit, we had to to make sure that it knew that it was um, at a certain at a certain time it was going to be over this location on the Earth, and so that's kind of how we helped update the system and um, make sure that it continued to be accurate um, and and in sync with how we were um, planning our operational sequence uh, before we told it to track to a location and then take a picture. So the ADCS software is kind of taking all of that in and it's figuring out, okay, so I'm here based on input that I'm getting from all of these other systems. I know I have to orient this way to track um, to this location. Um, and that doesn't necessarily, so like sometimes based on how the spacecraft is oriented, like sometimes pictures might be upside down, I guess, but if that makes sense. So like if usually on mountains, like in the, in the north, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and then we, we downlink that and then, you know, we try to f locate where it is on the map. We might have to like, you know, flip the image kind of around or rotate it or something based on what that orientation ends up being. But that's basically how it's, it's figuring all of that out. I see. So I want to go back to schedule files and I'm wondering kind of what goes into a schedule file because say the spacecraft is going overhead and then you're going to send it a schedule file. So would that be kind of on the next pass, uh, I don't know, turn the camera on, get the ADCS ready to point the lat long at Phoenix and then at this time take a picture because you know you're going to be overhead at this specific time. And yeah, I'm just kind of wondering how a schedule file kind of works and how it's structured. Yeah. Um, and basically what you said is kind of all we use schedule files for. <laughs> um, schedule In a general sense, the schedule file, it's, it, it is just meant to kind of denote the commands that need to happen one after another in order for you to do a certain operational sequence. Um, and that's all mission-based. Um, so for us, anything that we were really sending with the schedule was basically all of the commands that we had to send in order to tell the ADCS, update the ADCS, tell it to track a certain coordinate on the ground, and then take a picture at a certain time. Um, and then we also had to send a command to transfer all of those images to the OBC. So there's, it's a, it was a combination of, um, command, uh, I guess, operational commands to the ADCS and the camera, and then some, uh, maybe it's, I don't know if it's appropriate to call them maintenance commands um, to some degree, um, where, you know, those images eventually have to be transferred over. Um, and all of the, basically, we have to understand, when you're creating a schedule, you have to understand how long, it's not necessarily how long commands are going to take to execute, um, well, no, that, that's, that is the right, mm, that, I would say that's the right way to just describe it. So like a command takes like, you know, a mill, fraction of a second to actually execute on an OBC, but tracking, for example, took us, oh, I think, I think it was about like a minute to track, um, you know, fully track over Phoenix. So we had to make sure that, okay, we, you know, we understand, um, you know, the, the, rate of um, the, the rate of orientation of the ADCS and how long that's going to take uh, to get from point A to point B. And then we can we can run that in simulations as well and, and uh, get a good baseline estimate for how long tracking a tracking sequence usually takes. Um, so it's it's kind of understand understanding that and understanding even for like transferring images to the OBC, um, that goes very heavily with your system level testing and, and the, the, well, for us, the, yeah, system level testing and any kind of just even component level testing that you're doing, because you have to know, okay, how long does it actually take one image to just get transferred from the camera to the OBC? Um, and it, I think for us, it took about, take two minutes, two, two or three minutes, I think, to fully transfer one image, just with how much, um, much stuff went into that. Um, so you have to be aware of all of that um, and also take into consideration. So like if with uh, an infrared camera, for example, usually 
you want to make sure that it, you want to give it, so <laughs> our camera wasn't always on. So we had to, the schedule file first had to turn on the camera and then also give it, make sure that that turn on time was done early enough such that the camera can warm up and get to thermal equilibrium um, within the spacecraft because it, with a, an infrared imager, yes, you're collecting you know, a ground surface measurement, but it, the camera is also influenced by other sources of heat that are around it because it's, it's, all of that is, is essentially influence, influencing what the detector sees, um, not necessarily, yeah, <laughs> what, what the, the source sees, which is, which is the detector. So you have to think about things like that as well um, if there's any kind of warm up time that you need, um, any sort of calibration sequence that you need to incorporate as well um, into the, the schedule file. So, so that way you have a, a calibration source that you can then kind of use to help with post, uh, post processing um, on the ground. So we did have a calibration sequence that would always execute um, before we actually tracked a location on the ground and then took a picture. And then we would transfer all of the images and then we would basically turn off the camera um, and potentially anything else that we didn't need. So that was kind of our main uh, sequence of operations, at least for that science mode. Mm -hmm. So I wanna to move to flight software. And then you mentioned using you use some software from Goddard. I think if I remember correctly, it's called CFS. I don't remember yeah. what it stands for. Um, but yeah, can you talk a little bit about what that software is, kind of what it does, basically? Yeah. Um, let's see. Whatever. So CFS stands for the Core Flight, core flight System. Okay. Um, and this was kind of what our, uh, more of like our, our software framework was. Um, or not, it's more like our, our application framework is, is what we refer to it. So CFS basically kind of, I, Craig is, was always better at, at talking at, talking about this more so than I was, but it, it basically kind of gives you a, a framework to for us to then implement all of our own um, software applications. So I guess what I mean by that is, when we program the spacecraft, we were writing applications for all of these different components. So we had an application uh, for the ADCS, for the camera, and those applications would basically handle commanding. So if we wanted to say, send a command to the camera to take an image, um, we our, our schedule file would, would have uh, like the command number and then any, any parameters we needed to have in that. Um, so the OBC would kind of read that from the schedule file and say, okay, so based on this, I'm gonna tell the camera to take an image and these are the other parameters I need to give it. Um, and then it sends that command to our, um, our camera application, which takes in that command. And then um, basically, creates, so I mean, the, the command is, is just a, a sequence of, of bytes um, that have to go to the camera. And it's and these sequence of bytes are, are something that the, the software that's running on the camera that was developed by FLIR understands and then can use to, um, you know, it, it knows to take a picture. Then it does its own thing and it, it actually takes the picture, but it has to get the right um, you know, byte sequence in order for it to know that that's what it has to do. So that's that's what our uh, software applications handled, which was all of that kind of, you know, um, uh, command structure and transfer. And then um, anything that was also associated with collecting any sort of telemetry or uh, other data like images um, from the, that hardware. So, because we had to write all of those, we needed an application uh, framework to kind of help us um, implement all of that. Uh, otherwise, there's a lot of just additional uh, lower level software that we would have to write on top of that to just help uh, manage how um, information is handled and, and transferred from application to application. 
Um, so CFS gave us the functionality to, to, to really handle that. And then um, all of the applications that we developed basically had to be developed uh, with an understanding of, of CFS in mind because we had to tie whatever we wrote back into CFS and make sure that both of those things meshed well together um, so that uh, you know everything is basically handled seamlessly and, and our software can actually run. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so so in a, in a, which means that you know CFS was it, it's it was very important that we really fundamentally understood CFS and how to use it before we actually went off and wrote any kind of application because if we wrote something and we implemented all of this incorrectly, then it was going to be a lot more work to go back and, um, and fix it later. So we, we spent a lot of time just really trying to understand it and uh, you know, also talk with, um, talk with the, the developers who actually uh, made it to make sure you know, we, we could answer, uh, they could answer our questions um, and things of that nature. And it, we also chose it because it was, um, we had gone, or some of our software members had gone to a workshop on it and we knew that it was being used by other CubeSat groups, um, especially at NASA uh, at the time and, and that it was, it was a good application framework to use. And so that's, that's why we picked it. Mm -hmm. um, so that's mainly what CFS was used for. And then you if also that makes know, sense. <laughs> yeah, I think so. And then you mentioned some other software, some GOM space software that utilizes the space protocol. I'm wondering mm -hmm. kind of what that all is. Um, yeah, basically, I don't really know anything about it. So, sure. Um, so the, the CubeSat space protocol is different. Um, so CFS was mainly for all all of our software applications and how they transfer data to one another. Um, the CubeSat space protocol is a protocol um, that I. I don't remember if it was, I remember that it was like developed by, I think originally developed by two people in college or something. And then they, they kind of took it out into the industry, but I don't remember if both of those people ended up working at Comspace or if they just adopted it. Um, but basically what keep the CubeSat space protocol or CSP as you might also hear it referred to does um, is it was mainly just used on all of our Grom space components. Um, which were really only two, <laughs> which was just the um, our Nanomind OBC and then the Axe 100 transceiver. Um, and so basically what this did is it, it handled data transfer between both of those components. Um, so there is, in, in being a protocol, there is a certain protocol structure that um, you, you have to adhere to when you're sending when data is being transferred between one component and another. So, uh, so that, I, I wouldn't say that it posed challenges for us because now we had this other protocol we had to, to account for, um, but it was another thing that we really had to learn and, and also just fundamentally understand. Um, it also, I think when things, when, yeah, when data was was transmitted, it was also transmitted in um, in that that protocol format. So once we got a message back from um, from the transceiver on the ground, uh, we had to, you know, kind of go back and say, okay, so when when you're when you're there's so many protocols. <laughs> I, I hope uh, um, this. So I hope this doesn't get confusing. But when, at least when you transmit something, you have like a, an RF protocol that you use. Because um, basically, I mean, what protocols are doing is it, it's you're identifying where something's coming from and like where it's going to. Um, so there's an RF protocol that we had to incorporate um, for us. That was AX25, which is just a, a very typical. RF protocol that's commonly used by, by um, in the amateur radio community. Um, and then so we have to say, okay, so if we're getting something ground, okay, this is the, the AX25 protocol, uh, which is our RF side. And then, and then we have this CSP protocol mm -hmm. uh, or the CSP header, 
which you know is at the the front of all of our data, and then we have all of the data um, in the middle, and then there are footers that kind of end both of those, um, and other things that that wrap into that as well. But um, basically, that's what it, that's what makes it so important is because if you don't, at least for because what you care about is the data. You don't necessarily care about. I mean, the the headers. Are nice because that's can be like what you use to to check that you're actually getting what you're supposed to get. Um, but for like ground software and even flight software wise, you have to understand how all of that is packaged because you like you just want the data in there. You don't want to have you want to get rid of the header and the and the the footers that are involved in that and just um, get the data from this packet that you've sent. So. Our software had to understand. Okay, this head, you know, the the CSP header is going to be four bytes. I think it was long. Um, I have to get rid of that, and then at the fifth byte is when the data starts. So, like that's kind of where all of that became really important for us. Is is with um, just understanding what it was that we got back, and um, making sure that we had software in place that could parse that data and just collect the information that we really needed. So that's kind of, that's essentially what, what that did. <laughs> Wait, if all I of wanna, that made sense. <laughs> yeah, I think, yeah, just okay. keeping track of all those protocols and stuff like the FCC, as far as like transmitting and all that. I mean, I'm sure it's a huge hassle. I've never worked on comms, so I've never had to go through that, but it sounds like a huge pain. Um, but so I want to learn more about that electrical issue that you had on the flat set where I think you said there was some uh, problem with the battery system from Clyde and then the OBC from Gom Space and there were some resistor problems. So can you talk a little bit about that? It seems like a pretty interesting um, kind of flat set debugging story. Yeah. Um, and that actually, that goes back to kind of what you were asking me about earlier is, you know, is, is um, so this ended up being an issue with I2C, which goes back to what you were asking me earlier about, you know, is I2C more of a, a hardware or like a software based thing. Um, so this was a kind of towards the beginning we were we had all of our components we were trying to and we were trying to connect everything to our OBC. Um, now let, let me let me back up a little bit. So one thing that we found was very useful for development is uh, programming everything, basically using your interfaces as much as you possibly can. Um, so basically writing a program that could run on the OBC, getting it to run on the OBC, and, um, and making sure that um, the OBC could actually communicate with our EPS or our GPS or whatever component we were trying to send a command to. Um, it's basically just trying to test as you fly, um, as, as they like to say. Um, so this was kind of at the beginning when we were trying to, to send commands from our OBC to other components over I2C. Um, this was our, in particular, this was our radio system, which was operating over I2C. And we were trying to get ready for that demo that we were talking about earlier, which was just take a picture and then downlink it. Um, and so we were trying to send commands to our transceiver and it was working at first. Um, we had, well, it was working at first and then it wasn't working. And so we were, we were trying to figure out, okay, well, what changed and why can't we transmit anything to it now? Well, first we thought it was broken. So, um, we had to first make sure, okay, the voltages are fine. Like this is working fine. I can plug into it by itself and it, all of the, it's telemetry is good. So we didn't break anything, um, but something's different. And what it ended up being the issue is that when, when we were successfully sending commands, we had had a, um, we had, I think we had an Arduino board connected to it. Uh, Cause we were initially seeing, trying to see if we could transmit something just from an Arduino. Um, which did not work, <laughs> um, but that Arduino, um, since we were trying to work that over I2C, it had pull-up resistors in it. Um, 
And so those pull-up resistors were, it, it, it allowed that, that voltage line to be pulled up to what it needed to be in order to, to send a signal. Um, and so that's what allowed the OVC to actually send something successfully to our, our transceiver. Um, and then we took the Arduino away and then it wasn't working. And the reason for that was because there wasn't an I2C pull-up resistor on the motherboard that housed the, um, the OVC and the transceiver. Um, so in taking that away, we weren't completing, we weren't making that circuit as, as complete as it needed to be to actually send information. Um, and so, so that wasn't there. Um, and we also found the same issue with our EPS system. Um, so our, our EPS system didn't have an I2C pull-up resistor on there as well. So we, we were um, we had to debug that. Uh, this this was a little bit later after we figured out that that initial I2C issue. But um, basically, what what all of this comes back to is is that. When you're buying off-the-shelf components from these vendors, um, usually, you know, they're also taking their system and they want to give you a kit, right? Um, they kind of make all of their components compatible with one another, and then they can fly their own CubeSats um, as a as a system. Um, and so, the reason this this issue came about because with GOM space hardware, they had put their I2C pull-up resistors in their EPS system. And Clyde Space, who was our supplier for the, the our EPS system, had put their pull-up resistors with their OBC <laughs> board. So nothing in our whole entire in our entire spacecraft at the time had the right pull-up resistors to enable I2C communication. So what we ended up having to do is we had to implement, um, we had to put to 2.2 kilo ohm resistors on our interface board, um, so we could pull that line up to the voltage that it needed to be, uh, and so that was something that we found through testing, failing, and then going back. Once that testing failed, going back and looking at our documentation to understand, okay, you know what? What aren't we accounting for? Um, is there something missing here that that we should see? So that. Um, kind of became like our testing methodology is like something isn't working. Can we debug anything just with testing? No. Um, go back and look at the documentation, see what it tells you. And then based on that, go from there. Mm -hmm. So so I'm also wondering about the ADCS testing because uh, I guess we haven't mentioned this in a while, but one of the other demos that you had to do was to do an ADCS demo where you have the spacecraft just pointed at a specific target just on the ground. So I'm wondering what was your testing setup for that? Because obviously you have to ha find a way to balance a spacecraft in 3D space and then be able to have whatever actuators you have actually move the attitude. So I'm wondering what the test setup was for that. Yeah, and that one, well, this is an unfortunate, this is a disappointing test setup, I guess, because it's not, so with our ADCS, we didn't, we don't have like a, an air bearing table or anything. We didn't try the, some people have tried putting like strings um, you know, oh. suspending it with a string, oh. and so it can it can actuate and move. Um, and all of that was either resources we didn't have or too risky for us to try. So um, anything with our ADCS was basically validated via analysis. Um, so our, our ADCS came with its own uh, uh, test software, where you could uh, it it had a so. There's a software, and, and you could add in your own like model of your spacecraft, and then send send it commands, um, and then see the the CubeSat like move, oh. um, and, and see the output, and, and make sure that that output matched what you wanted to have. So a lot of a lot of our requirements were were basically verified using that um, analysis software, and then when we were um, basically because. You also have to, you still have to make sure the hardware does it, what you're expecting it to. So we still had to do things like um, with our sun sensors, for example, um, uh, you know, shining a light on each individual one and making sure that um, when the ADCS gave us telemetry, um, we could, we saw that the right sun sensor was illuminated. Um, you know, if we held a magnet like near the spacecraft, uh, we could 
see the what the magnet what the the vector was um, mm -hmm. from that and make sure that it was what, what we were giving it because um, if that's wrong then you end up you have to update the firmware that's on the ADCS um, and you don't want to do that once you've fully packaged everything up because <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, it's you you it's very hard to do that um, in that case so so for our ADCS demo, it was really more of a flight software demonstration where we wanted to just check off that if we sent a, a software command to the ADCS to tell it to track a certain uh, coordinate, um, it would do what we, what we wanted it to. Um, so we were basically looking to see that the response from the ADCS was um, was what what we wanted. And, and with that response, you basically, you're comparing it to, you usually get like a command and telemetry dictionary. So it will tell you how to send all of those commands. And then also um, will tell you what response you should get back from it, if it's successful or if it fails. And um, so that kind of helps you check your software. Um, so we were able to send all of those to an, an engineering model unit, which didn't have reaction wheels or magnet workers um, or anything else in it. It was just a board um, with all of the, the software that the ADCS was using on there. Um, so basically we could tell it to track to a lat long coordinate and the ADCS wouldn't go crazy <laughs> um, and try to move all over the place because it didn't have any of those actuation systems in there. So um, so that's kind of what that, that demo was, was, just checking that all of that worked. So we, we were prepared for orbit. And how much of that is already validated by the fact that you're buying a whole ADCS system from a vendor like Gom Space, who I'm sure does a bunch of checks before actually sending out to a customer? Yeah. Um, the ADCS we got was the MAI 400 from Maryland Aerospace, which I think is now Adcol Maryland Aerospace. Oh, okay. um, but I, I mean, I think Gom Space also offers ADCS systems. I'm not too sure. Um, but with that, in terms of what's already verified um you can trust that the well you can trust that the performance and like the specifications that they give you is going to be verified basically what you need to verify with with your setup is um if you have all of your um system specific characteristics correct like so our firmware had to be updated such that it understood like, um, so I mean, there's there's control system involved. So we had to kind of work with uh, MAI to understand how to update the, the, the gains of the control system. So, so all of that was being controlled correctly. Um, we also had to make sure that they understood our system configuration and that what we thought our, you know, X, Y, Z uh, vector coordinate system was also matched up with what the ADCS thought it was. Um, because if not, then yeah. it's not, um, you know, we could have solar panels on our, you know, maybe negative X and negative Y face. The ADCS thought it was something else, then it would orient your solar panels away from, um, away from the sun instead of towards it. So those are kind of the checks that, that you need to make sure of. Um, but you can really trust that a lot of the um, specific operation, um, uh, you know, control rates, um, things of that nature will, should, will work, especially if, you know, if the components already been space qualified and um, flown on other missions. I want to go back to FlatSat, and I'm wondering kind of some stories of the day in the life test that you had and kind of what problems came up that you didn't see, but then that you would, that you didn't see coming, but you actually got to see in FlatSats and then just debugging those problems. Oh, man. Um, <laughs> trying to think. So the interesting, I mean... I would say the problems ended up being a lot more interface related. So things like the I2C um, issue. Well, I guess that's not necessarily day in the life test. So that's kind of like, so the way that we kind of made Phoenix is we kind of, we did all of these 
demos so we could gradually build up functionality. So that's why we started with this kind of like, okay, first we just want to take a picture and then downlink it. But in addition to taking a picture and downlinking it, okay, we also have to command orientation. We have to make sure the GPS respond um, can properly get time updates. So like, so those became other smaller demos that came after that. But the, the most important thing to demonstrate first was just taking a picture and then downlinking it. So we started there and then kind of built all of these individual demos up until we had this full thing that we could then do a day in the life test of. And what a day in the life test is, is you're basically just testing um, what it, it is. It is basically what it sounds like. <laughs> you're testing what an average day in the life of the spacecraft should look like. So this is running it through all of the operational modes that you expect to, to do in orbit um, exactly as you intend to do them. So testing as you fly and making sure that all of them execute the way that you need them to. Um, so interesting things, I guess, that you find with, with this um, that you don't find through individual component testing. Uh, really just, I think the most interesting thing was just kind of understanding how to optimize the, um, optimize scheduling. And then day in the life also needs to involve um, uh, the ground side. So, so when you're sending schedules to the spacecraft or you're trying to send other maintenance commands to the spacecraft, um, basically during like, okay, so what do you want a pass to look like? Um, are you uplinking a schedule? If so, what kind of checks should you do before you uplink a schedule? Um, like you want to make sure the spacecraft is healthy and everything's good to go before you send it the schedule where it's going to do a bunch of things that could possibly make something worse if um, you know if something's not right. Um, so so day in the life involves us testing that side of things and making sure that that we have developed a procedure for um, sending data to the spacecraft, getting data from the spacecraft, um, you know, what kind of checks and, and sequence of things that we want to do um, on every pass. Uh, and then it also involves just making sure that your, your schedule is executing um, the way that it's supposed to. So if, if you send it a, a schedule to maybe take a, take a track to a certain location at like 310, take an image at uh, you know, 310 and 30 seconds after that, and then do other things after that, making sure that those commands execute on time. Um, interesting findings. I weirdly can't remember any interesting findings. Um, well, it might be a good thing then. If yeah. Everything is working well. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's true. That's true. Yeah, um, yeah I think it, it for us, it, it's, it's really more of just the experience in trying to do just as much systems level testing, both software wise, um, interface wise, uh, as well. So like we did a we did a test where we took the spacecraft to the, the roof of one of the buildings. Um, and we stayed overnight on the roof. Um, and we just kind of ran through all of these, you know, in, individual sequences that we intended to do. Um, and the reason why we took it to the roof is because we needed to have that GPS signal. So in the lab, which was in the basement of one of the buildings at ASU, we could test everything as a system except for the GPS. The only thing we could get from the GPS was just it's, you know, what voltage uh, or uh, the voltage it was pulling, the current it was pulling um, from our, our EPS system. Um, uh, but but it, we couldn't test that it could um, update the clock um, and, and other things as well. So, um, so we had to take it to the roof and when we stayed there overnight and just, you know, tried a bunch of stuff, um, pulled an all-nighter, which was, uh, just a very interesting experience, but, uh, watching the sunrise from the roof was, was really cool. Um, I would do it. I would not do it again, but I would also do it again <laughs> in a weird way. Um, yeah. So it's mo mostly just that, and then um, also testing power power sequences as well, turning things off and on, 
um, you know, what happens with if you suddenly lose power. Um, yeah, just trying to, basically you're just trying to find a bunch of ways to break the spacecraft, but I can't think of any um, particular interesting things that, that we've, specific interesting things that we found apart from just trying to figure out how to optimize how the schedule ran um, and and how we how we should prepare for each pass, basically. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I want to switch to your program manager slash the system engineering side of what you did for Phoenix okay. and specifically the, pro the process of descoping because I feel like that's something that people just like, oh, we're making a spacecraft. Let's have it do all this really fancy stuff. Yeah. But at the end of the day, it's <laughs> like, what do we actually need to do in order to achieve just the objectives and just the objectives? Um, mm -hmm. So I wonder if you could just talk about that, that whole process of kind of where the objective started and you know, all the hardships of being, this is a college thing and you only have college students working on this. So the, the high kind of turnover rate that you talk about um, and all that. So yeah, just like kind of the process from your perspective of kind of de-scoping to what you actually need on the spacecraft. Yeah. Um, oh man. <laughs> um, there's, de-scoping was something that, you know, we were still kind of figuring out what we, I guess what we still really didn't need um, even late in, in the project. So like the, the SD card is a good example. Like we didn't want to write everything to the, to RAM because um, you know, there's, there's limited memory storage and our images were so large and, you know, we weren't sure we wanted to deal with deleting things. Um, so, but at the end of the day, that's another thing that you have to fully implement, fully test, make sure it's totally foolproof. Um, and, and it's not something that you need just to reach the, the minimum thing, which is storing it somewhere. Um, so it's kind of trying to, you're trying to figure out ways to make your life easier, essentially. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, we can, if we have to store an image, so basically with, with the whole take an image and downlink it, well, the image has to be stored somewhere before it can be downlinked. We didn't just, tran we can't, we actually cannot transfer it directly from the payload to our transceiver to just downlink that way. It has to go to the OBC, then the OBC has to put it, has to give it to the transceiver. So it has to be stored somewhere. Um, we already have the storage on the OBC, it's RAM. Um, we don't have to implement anything else. Um, we thought, you know, and, and for a long time, we thought that that was something that we should really push for. And it's just kind of you know, as you get closer to deadlines and you see all of these other things that you have to do and it's it's so much of a higher priority or all of those other things are so much of a higher priority. It's like, you know, we really don't need this to make a robust system. Because at the end of the day, that's what you're trying to do. You're, you're trying to make sure that when whatever you send to space is gonna work um, and it's gonna work really well. Um, and make sure it works really well. You have to test the crap out of every single software and physical interface that you have to make sure that all of that's going to play well together. So I would say figuring out what your minimum objectives are, it's, it's very difficult to do in the beginning for student teams who are also learning everything else. Um, so like when we started Phoenix, we had, we, we had no idea about a lot of things. Um, and it was very difficult for us to really understand what that kind of like minimum functionality exactly looked like because the system wasn't fully mature. Um, and we were still putting a lot of the pieces together and, and learning things. Um, and as, but as, as time went on and we got further into the project, you know, we bought hardware, we started playing with it. We, we, um, and, and started trying to send it commands and really understanding what, what all of the data sheets were telling us, what the data sheets weren't telling us and what we had to figure out along the way. Um, you just, you learn the spacecraft a lot more and it becomes, it, for, for us, it became easier to say, no, we don't need this. Um, at a minimum, we need that. Uh, or, you know, how long would it take you to implement this kind of a functionality like this? is something that would be super nice to have, but, um, you know, I don't know if I'll have time for it. What do you, what do you think? Uh, yeah, I, 
since you know now that we've programmed all of these applications, I know exactly how to do this, and it should be easy. Um, so, so those are the kinds of trades that were a lot easier for us to make later down the line once we really understood what we needed to do. Um, but for a minimum, it, it really it comes back to just trying to define what your your goal objective is. Um, so for us, the minimum objective was just take a single picture and downlink it. Um, and because because that was kind of more where like, you know, we just want this to be educational, send it to space and it does it does something um, versus something that's a lot more science driven. Um, so for example, at the beginning of the project, we were identifying like minimum success, but it was take a picture of Phoenix and take a picture of LA. Um, and as we got a lot closer to our deadline and, or our delivery date where we had to officially hand the spacecraft off and we can't touch it anymore, because once we gave it to NanoRacks, like it went into their um, deployer pods, they shipped, you know, they integrated that onto Cygnus and we don't get, the, we don't get to touch it. Like no one's going to be, um, you know, after it's integrated on Cygnus or after it's it's been launched and it's on the ISS, no one's going to plug a USB port into that and allow us to make a software update um, or test anything else out. So it's like once you hand it off, that's all the time you have, um, unless you want to do an update in orbit, which is very risky. Mm -hmm. um, so, so it, you really kind of have to understand, okay, what is the the minimum thing that's important to me? Um, for us, this, this was more of just the educational thing of like, take a single picture of Phoenix and downlink it. And we can do a lot with just that single picture. Um, and also in terms of minimum objectives and just thinking about what it is you really care about, um, for us, we, we also wanted to make sure that we had a system that could be operated by the people who developed it. So if we wanted to really make Phoenix do everything that it, it possibly could do, we could have dragged this project on for years um, and done a lot more with the payload, done a lot more with systems level testing and integration. But, you know, if you keep, we eventually, we have to deliver something eventually. And if you keep dragging it on, then you have a team of people operating the spacecraft that might not understand it as well. Um, and that's also very risky. Um, so, so we we didn't we didn't want that. So that kind of drove our okay. We need to deliver it by this date in order to make this date. What is it that we absolutely need? Um, and that kind of goes went along with getting rid of things like the SD card or um, one thing that we we ended up implementing, but we didn't list as a minimum requirement was deleting images. For example, it's so like our since we're storing everything on the camera's memory, um, the camera could only hold twenty images before it can't store anymore and you have to delete all of them off of there. So that's a feature that we don't need to implement to just take a single picture and downlink it. So it's it's all based on what you're really trying to achieve. Uh, and then once you understand the hardware a lot more, what kind of specific functionality can you not live with in order to make that goal? Cool. Uh, honestly, I think I have all my questions that I have for now. We've been almost for two hours now. So, um, yeah, I don't know. Um, I think that's pretty much all I have. I don't okay. know if there's anything. I mean, I feel like you've already said a lot between here and then all your podcasts. So I don't know if there's anything else that you'd like to add uh, before we end here. Uh, I, d I don't I know. Don't... putting you on the spot. I don't, <laughs> um, I don't think so. I usually, well, so one thing I'm hoping to do once the semester's over is mm. I, like a year ago, I started trying to like put all of this into a, like a book form, oh, um, yeah. which, cause it's, it's really hard to like, I just end up rambling mm -hmm. <laughs> if, if I try to describe like, you know, experiences we had and um, there's a lot, uh, there's a lot to talk about with just organization that a lot of student teams kind of ask me about. Um, that I, I want to put kind of into that resource to help. Um, but yeah, so I guess that's one thing maybe I will selfishly plug <laughs> um, is hopefully I can fin actually finish that this summer and um, it will be a resource. And if, if anyone, you know, 
um, out there listening to, to this podcast is interested in making a cube, starting a CubeSat team of their own, hopefully that becomes a, uh, a good resource to, to you. So. Yeah, no, I think that's a really good idea. I mean, because at that point you can organize it just a lot better. You can break it down into subsystems and like, mm -hmm. programs and systems by itself in general. Yeah, I think that'd be a really good idea. Have you already started or just in the I thought process? I started it like a year and a half ago. Oh, okay. um, and I, I wrote a lot down, uh, but it's not, it's definitely not cleaned up. And there's a lot more to say. I basically kind of wrote about a lot of the challenges that we had that, that you know, like we've talked about here and that um, I think we've, we've mentioned in a few episodes uh, on Phoenix in, in uh, my, my podcast. Um, but it, a lot of it doesn't go into how exactly did we start, break down all of our requirements, you know, do our trades, like what, what things are important for us to consider, like the, the kind of, that kind of stuff that people usually ask me about. So I wanted to, to think about it, put it into a decent words, hopefully, mm -hmm. and then give it to the, the vast uh, space of the internet, so. Oh, now that we're talking about it, I'm wondering first, what, what were your goals when you were beginning to make your podcast? And then where do you see it going now kind of in the future, along with the book that you're talking about? Oh my goodness. Um, oh, hopefully so many, so many ways. Uh, I guess when, well, when I started it, I, I, I started it because I was listening to Ologies with Allie Ward and she just interviews like all of these super cool scientists um, and people who like focus in all of these different areas uh, or ologies as, as she calls them. So like she's done radio, like, like, like radiology and she's done episodes on like taxidermy and it's just, just basically everything that you can think about. And I was like, wow, she gets to like go on all of these adventures and meet all these cool people. And like, I, I, that would be cool to do something like this. So I kind of just started it by just thinking I was just have, um, cool conversations with people, <laughs> um, hopefully on a lot of different technical topics, and then also just translate a lot of um, the lessons that we learned with Phoenix uh, into that as well. Because, you know, sometimes it's just easier for people to listen than it is for them to read. Um, mm -hmm. So so that was kind of the direction that I, I started with. And I, I think the direction that I'll still try to continue to go with it, um, just in thinking of different different technical topics that are relevant to how sp things in space come together. Um, and yeah, but mm -hmm. yeah, I know like YouTubers have like a little community and, and stuff like that. And I don't, I don't know if that is something that I'll, I will do, but um, mm -hmm. it would be cool. Just, yeah. <laughs> so I haven't, I haven't thought too much about um, it past that, to be honest. <laughs> Do you have a, do you have anything like, you know, like a, like dream and division or, or anything for, for your podcast? Kind of the same thing, honestly. Mm -hmm. I feel like we started for the same reasons. Cause also, I mean, kind of at the end of the day, it's just an excuse to like talk to smart people about what they do and about oh, yeah. what they're oh. really good at. So it's like, yeah. You know. And even, so, I mean, like I, like I started this in the summer after COVID had started. And so it was like, mm -hmm. it it was, it was nice to talk to people um, that I didn't usually talk to mm -hmm. because like, other than that, it was like, I talked to people I work with or I talked to my roommate. So it was kind of like, it's refreshing yeah. <laughs> for the people who do this as, as well as, as interesting for them. So, yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. I think so. Yeah, I agree. It's just like, especially people you talked to in the past and also, cause like, I don't know, it'd be kind of weird if you just reached out to someone and was like, Hey, can I talk to you about something for like two hours? Yeah. Then, like if you make it a podcast, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's, it's cool to like, I just think the stories are cool because mm -hmm. like, you know, we, we do this thing at ASU called engineering coffee and mm -hmm. um, people give talks basically every Friday um, on what their research is or like lessons they've learned. And sometimes if they're people from ASU, sometimes they're people from um, other universities or like JPL. Um, and so you know, it's like you would never hear that stuff unless you went to that particular event. Mm -hmm. So I, I want to do something where it's like, I didn't have to go to that particular event to learn what they learned. I don't have to be in this group to know what they know. Um, 
so I, I mean, that's, that's, yeah, that's kind of why I, I like the podcasting platforms is because you should not have to know something just because you're not in the right place at the right time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with that. I think, yeah, I don't know. Cause I also make like YouTube videos and like other stuff, but um, yeah, it's more like, th I feel like this, this information should be like free. You know, we shouldn't have to pay mm -hmm. all this money through like school, which is so expensive in the U.S. Yeah. Get this and something you don't even get at school. Like yeah. everything I learned from Phoenix, I didn't learn yeah, in a it's, class. <laughs> it's like you so. learn so much more from not school when you're at school. Mm -hmm. Well, if you make, yeah, if you do stuff like CubeSats, but yeah. Okay. I mean, yeah, I think that's pretty much all I have here. I'm going to stop recording. And also just okay. like, don't, don't worry. About